Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Kazagov, and I am a project officer in the HIV AIDS Bureau and co-chair of the HAB Rural Health and HIV Work Group. My colleague, Sonia Hunt Gray, will be joining this session towards the end of the presentation. Welcome to session 301, Innovative Approaches to Reducing HIV-Related Stigma Across Rural Communities. Next slide, please. So HRSA is the Health Resources and Services Administration, and here is an overview of this agency. It supports more than 90 programs that provide healthcare to people who are geographically isolated, economically or medically vulnerable through grants and cooperative agreements. Every year, HRSA programs serve tens of millions of people, including people with HIV and AIDS, pregnant women, mothers and their families, and those otherwise unable to access quality health care. Next slide, please. Within HRSA is the HIV AIDS Bureau, and here is the HAB's vision and mission. Optimal HIV AIDS care and treatment for all, and the mission is to provide leadership, resources to assure access to and retention in high quality integrated care and treatment services for vulnerable people living with HIV and their families. Next slide, please. So within HRSA's HAB uh, Bureau is the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. Some of the highlights here are that um, the Ryan White program provides comprehensive systems of HIV primary medical care, medication, and essential support services for low-income people with HIV. 87% 0.1% of Ryan White program clients are virally, were virally suppressed in 2018, exceeding the national average of 62.7%. Next slide, please. And then within the HAB Bureau is the Rural Health and HIV Work Group. Our mission is to provide support and resources to have recipients and stakeholders to assist in the delivery of optimal care and treatment for people with HIV in rural communities. Next slide, please. So the institutes. Um, this is the third of three parts of the institutes. Session 101 is the overview of HIV-related stigma and HIV care and treatment. So as I mentioned, there's three parts. And 101, as, um, as it indicates here, is the overview. And it includes the overview of Brian White programs in rural areas, characteristics of stigma, funding and resources, opportunities to reduce stigma, and the impact of stigma in the health setting. Session 201 is federal resources and community initiatives to reduce HIV-related stigma in rural areas. And during that session, it will address the AETC um, program components, interventions, and resources, special projects of national significance, current, past, and future initiatives, and and lastly, a community initiative to reduce HIV-related stigma through the use of training community health workers in collaboration with AETC and SPINs. And here we are at um, session 301. Next slide, please. All three sessions will have, will have looked at stigma through the characteristics of stigma lens. That includes actions, attitudes, and beliefs. Next slide, please. And here are some descriptive um, characteristics within attitudes, actions, and beliefs. Next slide, please. This is our contact information. Next slide. And here's a link to HRSA. Next slide. Next, I want to introduce our first presenter. Leslie McIntyre is from Montgomery, Alabama, and he is here to talk about the No Look campaign. Leslie? 
Good evening. How's everyone? As it says, I'm, I'm Leslie McIntyre, your um, peer mentor and consumer support specialist here at um, Medical Advocacy and Outreach in Montgomery, Alabama. Next slide, please. I have no relevant uh, financial or non-financial interest in this close. Next slide, please. The learning outcomes at the conclusion of activity participants will be able to, number one, describe the no-look anti-stigma campaign, Number two, explain the collaborative activities. And number three, su summarize how a campaign is planned. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The Lead Academy. Now, the Lead Academy started um, in, um, in 2017. It was launched by Compass. And it's, um, it is Lead which is leadership, education, and advocacy development, um, developed as a grassroots anti-stigma in initiative created by and for people living with HIV as a result of beginning awarded, of, um, as a result of being awarded $25,000 through the SPARC Southern Promoting Awareness and, and Real Knowledge Grant. Next slide, please. The goals of the LEAD Academy was to prepare members of the LEAD Academy for the launch of the No Look Anti-Stigma Campaign, Nothing ab About Us Without Us. The goals were to, you know, get them ready for, to launch a campaign into the, um, into the Montgomery area and surrounding areas so they can um, be able to teach and advocate uh, for, um, about HIV in the South. Next slide, please. Okay, how did we get started? We started recruiting activities, including putting flyers up for, um, in the clinic about Lead Academy. So we put flyers up all around the um, clinic and in our dental offices and um, in other surrounding areas so we can recruit people that wanted to be a part of it. And um, it was also by word of mouth and discussions in our consumer advisory board. Now, most of, uh, most of the people that um, we recruited came from my consumer advisory board. The recruitment results in, in a total of 13 participants, six males, seven females, including one self-identified uh, self trans woman. Next slide, please. What was our plans? To promote, uh, to promote fact, HIV has no look throughout the city. Our, uh, our participants came up with um, no look because they felt that HIV had no look. People wanted to put a label on how someone looked and they thought they was able to tell how people um, look when they, um, when they contract HIV, which is not the case. This is why um, it's being spread so far in, um, in Alabama because people think they can look at someone and think or and be able to see if they're positive. So we, um, we started the campaign and we went through billboards and flyers and red cards and um, we had their um, pictures put on the Montgomery Transit system. Members of the Lead Academy were photographed and, and the images were displayed all over the different mediums, which is, you know, on the billboards. And um, we had digital, digital billboards. We had um, a full wrap on the side of um, our Montgomery Transit system. And we did rat cars and flyers and everything to make sure everybody knew about the Lead Academy in um, Montgomery, Alabama. Next slide. So what did we do? We provided learning and um, we provided learning and interactive activities to foster and promote empowerment, education, engagement, and embar embracing life with HIV. People with um, HIV, people living with HIV, to tell their story with confidence and to become advocates for themselves and and strong leaders to educate how to host educational programs, engage in public speaking activities, develop a true working knowledge to help overcome myths and facts, and teach others risk reduction strategies, to engage peer-to-peer -peer interaction and learning, to embrace themselves in their personal first, as a, as a person first, and that HIV is merely a part of their life story. Next slide, please. 
Now the prep, prep activity came in and, and we really felt that we go, we needed to do more to get them ready other than what was being taught in the lead academy because you know we we can do as much teaching as we can but learning experience out in the, the streets and in the community is what we really get our, um, our information and we really get the um, interaction with people and their different things but the prep in-house came from MAO Behavior Health Team, provided a series of training to help lead members develop strategies to deal with a social stigma, which is also beginning the process of overcoming internalized stigma and how to respond to community response. And we also brought in one of our liaisons um, from Gilead, Vic Sorrell, to um, be able to provide you know one-on-one -on -one education and um, and help lead members to develop a better understanding of their disease and state that could be articulated in the individuals when presented to for other speakers' engagements. So we brought him in to make sure that they knew, you know, besides what was being taught in um, the Lead Academy trainings, we brought him in to be able to teach them, you know, in layman's terms, to what about, you know, HIV and different drugs and everything. We brought in behavior health to make sure their mindset was correct and um, they wasn't be able to um, be able to mentally be able to focus and be able to tell their story and without you know being nervous or you know distracted or you know worried about what the community going, was going to say so we brought in behavior health to make sure they was ready to make sure they would you know their mind and their heart was in the same place and um, the lead members met once or twice monthly to foster a bonding process amongst members. During these meetings, members provided feedback on personal experience, brainstormed ideas, and served as a peer support to one another. So during these meetings, we kind of we wanted to make sure everybody was um, was able to get up and do different types of scenarios and speaking and um, brainstorms on ideas of how can we you know, best serve the community and how can we get this out correctly? And um, we had peer-to-peer -peer, um, support, you know, they supported one another. They, they backed each other up and let them know that they could do this. You know, we got each other and, and um, this is what this Lead Academy is going to be. We have each other and we have each other's back and we go support each other in the best way to make sure that um, the people in the community know that HIV has no look. Next slide, please. Now the lead, now the prep, also the prep activities that we also did were lead, lead members completed training with the support, the consumer support specialists on how to read body language when in the community to know how to engage the audience and they conducting education activities. Now what I wanted to do with them was, you know, do different scenarios. Um, because you can, you never know what you're going to get when you get out into the community. You never know how you, you what adversities you're going to be able to have to face once you get out of there. And believe it or not, we did the the good part that were like good cop bad cop type situation. And believe it or not, they was able to recover from the bad cop faster than they were the good cop. So you know they wasn't they, they was always ready. They ready to go out in the community. And um and receive the negativity because they was ready for that. They their mindset was that I'm ready for whatever they got negative to say to me. But you wasn't ready for what the positive things they had to say to you. You wasn't you didn't give yourself up to be ready for that. So you know it was it was kind of surprising to me that they they um you know they took on the role of you know the negative part and received that more you know better than they did the, the good part. So we had to, you know, go back and, and let them know that they're worthy enough to, you know, be out in the community and, you know, receiving this education and um, was gearing them up to be ready. So we wanted them to make sure that when they got out there and they got, you know, got to speaking to people that it was knowledgeable and they was ready. And also the Lead Academy members developed a survey to gauge the knowledge of members of the general population regarding HIV versus myths and society ideas. These surveys were administered as various MAO events. Now we on once they graduated from Lead Academy, we we did um, certain events so they can be able to speak and tell their story. 
And um, during, after they spoke and told their story, um, we passed out surveys. We wrote up surveys so they can understand, you know, what they need to work on and what, you know, the audience need, need to know. And also what did they currently know about HIV? And it was surprising to find out that, you know, the community knew a little bit more and they were a little bit more knowledgeable. And they was also, you know, was a little bit more open to find out because it was coming from somebody that was living with it. So they was open to listen and they was open to learning new things and, and how. So the surveys were really good to um, know where we needed to work and, you know, what area we need to work in. Next slide, please. The imp implementation of activities. And we did focus groups, we did storytelling, we participated in MAO community engagement department activities collaboratively, like um, administered surveys, distribute risk reduction resources like condoms, you know, dams, and et cetera. You know, we provided education pamphlets and cards. You know, um, we did um, many activities to make sure they was ready. You know, we did a whole bunch of stuff to make sure that we wanted to, them to make sure they were absolutely ready to get out because, you know, these people came from, you know, places where they felt that they wasn't educated enough to do these programs. They wasn't smart enough to do these programs. And we, we had to let them know that um, even though they felt that they were education, edu educated enough, they were. They were subject, subject matter experts in their own HIV, and they can only tell their own story. So they, um, we want to make sure they knew that, and we want to make sure they was ready. Next slide, please. The No Look. No Look campaign was a collaborative effort by the leaders to combat the stigma of knowing that HIV has no look. No Look is a conversation started on what HIV looks like in the rural communities. How can you tell who has HIV by looking at them? The intent of No Look has, was to, to, to dispel the myth that someone who is HIV positive has a look and is not clean, is, is, is not a clean person. Now in the South, especially in Montgomery, if you're on any dating app or if you're on any um, place where you be able to meet people, the first thing they will put on their apps or you know on their particular page was that they are clean and they has no SDIs or you know HIV or anything like that which you know made people feel that people living with HIV are uh, they're not clean and which is not true because HIV has no look so you know you don't know who's clean and not clean and we want to dispel that we want we don't uh, want anybody to make be made to feel that because you're positive you're not clean which kind of moves into that you're not worthy of being with somebody because you're dirty and we we want to make sure that people knew that you know you don't really know how someone contracted HIV, and you know in, you don't know how you know what their story is behind contracting HIV. You know you can be stuck with a needle at at some point in time. So you know it, that doesn't mean that you're a dirty person or you know your body is dirty or you, you know anything like that. So. We want to dispel those myths and, you know, make sure we educated them and make sure the, um, the Leader Academy um, constituents was able to articulate that to them, that I'm not dirty. I, I'm just as clean as you are. I just was in a situation. So we wanted to make sure they knew that and make sure they can be able to articulate that to, you know, everybody that needs to be to need to know that. Next slide, please. Now this um, particular slide is for a video, which um, I had two of the Lead Academy graduates to do for me. One is Felicia Hardy, and the other one is Michael Bailey. And they was just so happy to um, share their story and do the video. And I hope y'all enjoyed that part. And I hope y'all learned something from um, the anti-stigma campaign that HIV has no look. And, you know, being for someone, particularly like myself, that has been positive for over 20 years, HIV has no look. Because if I feel that if I hadn't told you that I have been positive for, 20, for over 20 years, you wouldn't have known. 
So we want to dispel that in the South and we want to make sure people know that, you know, HIV has no look. We can be um, we can be people that you will never meet before and you never know anything about anybody. But we want to make sure everybody is knowledgeable that you ask certain questions about HIV. And even though if you, you feel that if they look like they're positive or they don't, you still need to ask questions because you can be wrong. And we want to make sure that when we go out into the community, we teach them how to ask questions or the certain questions to ask for somebody, if you're meeting somebody or you want to be sexually active with them, to make sure they know uh, what questions to ask and, um, and so on and so forth. Like, you know, have you been checked for HIV or are you on PrEP or anything like that? Just to, you know, have a start, you know, start a conversation so we can see where your mindset is. So we can get you out of, you know, just looking over, you know, the conversation about HIV. That's how it's being spread so, so much in the South because we don't want to have the conversation because, you know, even though one partner might be positive, we still don't want to have the conversation because some of us don't want to know. And we just want to be able to sleep with who we want to sleep with and not ask the questions. And we need to teach them, you know, how to ask subtle questions to be able to get on the conversation and do what we need to do. So I hope y'all enjoy the video. I hope y'all enjoy the presentation and thank y'all so much. So question number one, how do you think Nita can make an impact on your life? Well, just learning a lot more about HIV and stigma and the community and how less uh, information that's out there that, I should I say, how less people out there in the community don't know about all the new stuff that we're finding out. Right. Also, I think as a result of Leave Academy, I'm no longer, I'm no longer out of fear when explaining some of the causes of how people may contract and that surrounds HIV. I want society to know that when a person has been diagnosed with HIV, that it's no longer a death sentence, but it's an opportunity for them to embrace life and, to, and its many challenges. Okay, that's great. Okay, to see your face on billboards and the Montgomery Transit System. How did that make you feel after seeing yourself and do you feel that it was a milestone in your journey living with HIV? I feel that as a result of seeing my face on the billboard with the transit system, I was relieved because I was no longer hiding what I had, what, what had happened to me as a result of the accident that had happened to me in the work environment. And to let people know that HIV does, does not discriminate. It does not discriminate at all. It doesn't care what your or sexual orientation may be mm -hmm. or your ethnicity. Right. Okay. Well, to be honest, at the tender age of 55, I feel like uh, seeing my face on the billboard and saying, I was like, wow, you know, I'm doing something and whether I'm still here or not here, other folks going to see it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And just knowing that I made some kind of impact on my community. That's and I was so okay. proud of it. Well, that's good. Okay. Well, after each educational program, there were surveys taken. Mm -hmm. While doing the surveys, did you find out any of the, um, was it any of it shocking or was it surprising about the, um, what they knew or didn't know about, you know, what was on the survey after your educational program? It was a few things that was uh, kind of shocking, but it's like, I guess in my head, I knew some things, but just hearing it put a different way, it's like, I'm like, oh, okay, I get it now, so. I found the surveys to be informative to me because, as she just said, some of the responses I saw to some of the questions, information was presented to me in a different way, and it was more of an eye-opener for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, how you want to elaborate on that? Yes, as an eye-opener, I, I think our people, people don't know, for example, what people don't know, people still don't know of the ways that how people contract HIV. And people still don't know also that HIV, as I said earlier, does not discriminate now. It doesn't need to care who you are. And also, when I was, when I was uh, working as an educator, I found that HIV doesn't care, doesn't, doesn't care what age you are. 
We have pediatrics mm -hmm. in the pediatrics department of hospitals. Baby, baby's born HIV positive. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that shocked me the most is that a lot of people feel like it's a gay person disease or just uh, your sexual preference instead of realizing it's a lot of uh, so so-called straight people who have more because they feel like oh that's just something for them it's not for them but looking at statistics um, everybody and anyone can catch it. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's great. Yeah, it does not discriminate at all. Did you find it surprising that they answered the truth um, truthfully about their sexuality, even though you knew them? So even though you knew them and you knew who they were, and and um, did they answer? Did they feel comfortable answering the question about their sexuality on the surface? Yeah, honestly. I, I think uh, I say I was. I would say I was not I was not surprised because some people are still searching, still trying to, to find their identity. Mm -hmm. And I made the, the slogan LGBTCU and CU stands for confused and undecided. Okay. There's so many people out there who are still undecided, who are still living a double life to this day, mm -hmm. even in adulthood. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to and, 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 and to uh, <clears throat> to be to, to be more forefront. So yes, it's a struggle. Could say what you have been through. I, I mean, I have encountered the struggles that you have encountered in your lifetime. That's great. One more thing I wanted to say about um, was how we felt about people being truthful to think. I think uh, it wasn't shocking to me because the group, y'all made it so comfortable in here that we knew it wasn't just a group, it was just family. Mm -hmm. So it was so easy just to open up and say this and that. And when we had the, the little trials while we got up and spoke, uh, try to do the class ourselves, you know, it was able to do it because we was, it was almost like little kids playing and but we had grown folks here, but we was talking to family. Mm -hmm. So it made it easier. Was yeah. there anything else y'all want to share about your experience from um, Lead Academy or graduating or doing the process of, you know, you learning and being educated and everything? Is there anything that pops up you want to share with people? I, I believe as a result of, of Lead Academy, like I said, the fears that I once had before and, and then going while going through the Academy and then receiving this new knowledge, I became more aware of the things that surrounded me, the things and the experiences that I encountered day by day. I don't know I have those phobias now. Mm -hmm. Even when I, when I may encounter people who are going through a struggle, for example, like if I'm at the bus stop, for example, I see a person who may be transgender. And when I see people talking about this individual or making little smirky comments about mm -hmm. the person, I, I'm the first one to say, Lord, have mercy, because I see them as, I see a person as regards to what age that individual may be. I see them as somebody's child. Mm -hmm. That's still somebody's child, and as we say, especially in the community of people of color, we say a mother, a dad may walk away, but a mom gonna say, regardless of what he or she is, that's still my child. Mm -hmm. That's still my child. Well, one of the biggest things I love about everything I've learned is I'm glad that I took the notion to pay attention to a a poster in the wild and I asked my doctor, uh, you know, what was Lee the Cat? You know, what was uh, the Cavs meeting? And she told me, you know, try because I think it'll do you some good. And it was other than my doctor and my health and everything, finding the group and everything and being open and learning and this and that, it was just mind blowing because I got a whole new education family around mm. me and then how we we love on one another when somebody's going through something. We used to have the prayer circle and stuff so it was family for because everybody might not have a good family system at home but we had it here at the meeting so you know it's it's good. Well, I thank y'all for doing this for me, and I um I appreciate y'all um going through the academy, and I appreciate y'all graduating and getting out and educating people. Beautiful and day. I still look at that picture. It is. It's a beautiful <laughs> day, and we thank y'all.
May I say that was uh, phenomenal, um, Leslie. Thank you. I, uh, I start, I'm from Arkansas. I started my HIV work in the late 80s. And what you have done is if the space is safe and it's outward, people were talking and just sharing. They, I don't, I've never seen that anywhere in terms of just folks being comfortable. And you could tell that there's some, you know, time frame where folks still think, you know, you know they're talking about transmission and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, but it doesn't matter. Now that they're talking about it, it's going to make a difference in right. seeing herself. Hey, on folks, um, I'm sorry to have to. Um, I know, I know, I know. I'm sorry. But he, I just no, said, no. I'm sorry. Good words and, and good praise, um, but we have a time constraint. And That's so true. True. Yeah. That's true. Leslie, That's okay. I, have, I would be remiss. <laughs> you see the thank you slide? Yes. Okay. So we're back to the, the PowerPoint. Great. So Leslie, do you want to do any kind of closing remarks and we'll just, we'll just take the edit from there? We can take the edit from there. Okay. Do you want me to just move forward to the next slide then? And we'll start at the, the, the next person, we'll count them in. So I'll just say something right here and then we'll move on, okay? You want to say something here? Okay, so yes. I'm going to count you in then, okay? That's all right. Okay. Barbara, can I just apologize to the, I'm so sorry, I'm on call in the hospital and I have to go back to rounds um, at five o'clock with my team. Um, so I'm gonna miss the NASDAQ presentation and I apologize. I will look forward to watching it um, when, uh, when, when we all come back together uh, in August. So I just, just wanted to apologize to you all. Um, I'm gonna do my presentation and then sign off. So I'm sorry. Great seeing you. <laughs> I get to see you too. And that's the beauty of this being recorded. <laughs> I'm going to have to sign off in a little, in a little bit also. I have another meeting coming up. Tell me when I can jump in, Joanna. Okay, I'm going to count you in from 10 like I did earlier. Okay. okay. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Thank you, Leslie, for that um, very informative collaborative and awareness campaign that you shared and that um, really moving um, video that you included. Thank you for that. You. Next speaker is Dr. Rebecca uh, Dillingham. Next slide, please. And she's going to talk about her program with, um, next slide, please. Positive links. Uh, Dr. Dillingham, please. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction, uh, Barbara, and thank you, Leslie, for sharing that incredible program, such an inspiration. Uh, so I'm uh, delighted to have the opportunity to share a little bit about a program uh, that we've developed in our clinic, which is a rural-based clinic uh, in Western Virginia. We serve about 900 people living with HIV who live across 52 counties uh, and so who are uh, quite uh, geographically dispersed. So next slide, please. Uh, these are my disclosures. I have received a grant from Gilead and provide some consulting services. Next slide, please. Um, for the learning outcomes, I'd uh, like to share with you uh, enough so that you're able to describe the elements of the Positive Links uh, platform for people living with HIV, uh, identify some performance measure outcomes, and summarize uh, the impact of Positive Links uh, on HIV-related stigma. Next slide, please. Um, maybe next slide, please. That, that one doesn't look like mine. There we go. Uh, so this is uh, just a quick shot of what the uh, app looks like on a phone, but I'm gonna move on to the next slide. So as I was describing, we serve a community that lives uh, in um, many rural communities across Western Virginia. Um, and unfortunately, these are some of the challenges that face people living with HIV in rural Virginia and also really across the country. Many of them will be familiar to you. Uh, you see stigma in bold right there at the top, but certainly the other challenges include transportation, poverty, 
isolation, substance use, and mental health challenges. Next slide, please. Some of our team had the incredible privilege of working uh, in the late 90s um, in countries like South Africa and Haiti where uh, the antiretroviral uh, medications were, for, were becoming available for the first time in those countries. And I and others on our team were really inspired by the way our colleagues used mobile phones uh, to help coordinate care. And we thought about what about bringing that back to Virginia? So this was about 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, we were fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to start off with just a very simple mobile health program. So you might be asking, what is mobile health? So it's pretty simple and you may already know. Uh, it's anything uh, that uh, clinics or hospitals or providers or organizations do with a cell phone uh, to help support the delivery of care. That's one definition and I think a good one. I'm going to also make the argument and I'll give you a little heads up on this that I think that mHealth can also be a great way uh, to empower uh, people living with HIV and other people living with chronic diseases. So next slide please. When we first started, we had a very simple approach. We just sent a text message that was chosen uh, by the person living with HIV to them each day from a server uh, to remind them at the time of day that they wanted to take their medicine. Uh, so as you might guess, this was an intervention to try to promote adherence to medication um, and not one that was focused on stigma or other outcomes. Next slide, please. However, we noticed some really interesting things about the ways in which people experienced these messages coming from a server to their phone in their own voices. And I put some of those quotes up uh, that pushed us to starting to think about how we could work with our consumers um, uh, to design something that could leverage this feeling of care. And I wanna draw your attention to these quotes. So you can see in the, um, on the left, it feels good that I can actually talk to someone every day about it, meaning HIV. In the orange bubble, having somebody at your back is a positive thing. The realization that we had from this um, information that was given to us by people in our program was that this interaction with the cell phone was actually experienced as a connection, was actually experienced as care, and actually felt really good. On the one hand, it made me a little bit sad that some of my, um, the people that I am privileged to care for uh, had not a whole lot in their lives and this little message from a server was making them feel better. That made me kind of sad. But on the other hand, I thought, hey, if that makes people feel better, let's do more of it. Um, and so that's what we've worked on. Next slide, please. Over the past 10 years, we have developed a mobile platform called Positive Links um, that has a number of different components. Uh, it does um, address uh, care management and self-monitoring. Uh, it provides educational resources, but I really want to draw your attention to social support. In the last video, we saw that incredible testimony of um, people from the No Look campaign that told us of the importance of being able to come together. Unfortunately, in our community, um, in our group of communities, there are many barriers to coming together. Some of them are geographic uh, because many of our uh, clients live uh, 50 to 250 miles away from the clinic. Some of them have to do with lack of transportation and many of them have to do actually uh, with uh, stigma. So I am gonna show you some outcomes from uh, that we have measured associated with use of the app and then I'm really going to hone in on this social support component and the ways in which we have been interested uh, in this mHealth 
intervention uh, impacting stigma. Next slide, please. So on this slide, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, what we call our Positive Links version 1.0 outcomes. This was from uh, a study that looked at 12 months of use for a population uh, of uh, people living with HIV uh, who seek their care at our clinic. This was a population that had struggled a lot uh, with um, care uh, engagement and had uh, not previously had um, great success at achieving viral suppression. So on the left, you can see that these individuals uh, really improved their engagement in care and their viral suppression over that year of use, and that has continued. But I'd like, next slide, please. I'd like to really focus on, uh, oops, sorry, go back one, please. Um, on stigma. So I put a uh, blue box um, around this outcome. I mentioned the increases in engagement in care and an HIV viral load, but let's be real. Those are important outcomes to all of us, uh, but the actual experience of um, stigma or lack of social support, those are things that really make people feel good or bad during the day. So another thing that we were hoping to impact with this platform uh, was stigma. Uh, we were hoping that we might be able to decrease people's feelings of stigma. And so we measured uh, stigma scores using the Berger Stigma Scale, which is a validated way to assess stigma um, amongst people living with HIV. And we measured that at the beginning of the um, project and then 12 months in. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit, a lot more about that. Um, and I'm gonna note right now that actually stigma scores improved. Next slide, please. Um, if you wanna learn more about positive links, I just put these up as references uh, for the other features, but next slide, please. I really wanna focus on stigma. So as we all know, uh, stigma has many facets. It can be uh, at the individual level in terms of the way we talk to ourselves and think about ourselves related to um, uh, challenges that we're facing, including HIV. There can be interpersonal stigma in between uh, people in our family and our community. Uh, institutional stigma um, can be inflicted on uh, people living with HIV and others because of the ways in which we deliver care. And certainly society um, it, it, it inflicts stigma on people living with HIV in a number of ways, sometimes because of their diagnosis, but also for a lot of other reasons and intersectional identities um, that may uh, make them uh, feel more stigmatized and in fact suffer more stigma from people who are inflicting it upon them. So in next slide, please. In thinking about positive links, we were particularly interested in interpersonal stigma. Going back to Leslie, I was so jealous, you know, being able to get people to come together and have that opportunity to feel the love um, that comes from that. We do have the opportunity to do that a little bit uh, where we are, uh, but we wanted to do a lot more of that. And so we created something called the Community Message Board. Now, this community message board, uh, next slide please, uh, is a space within the secure positive links app that allows people to talk to other people living with HIV in an anonymous way. So people are asked to choose a nickname and not the nickname of their favorite pet, not a nickname that they had when they were kids, a nickname that's really going to preserve their anonymity. Why do we do this? We did this because our patients, our consumers told us that that's the way they wanted it. And they wanted us to enforce that. So we um, have an anonymous uh, community message board uh, where people who are part of this program can come together and talk about whatever they want to. Um, sometimes they talk about living with HIV. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. They talk about religion. They talk about the weather. They talk about a lot of different things that are happening in their lives and provide uh, support. 
You can see from uh, this member, uh, member's um, quote, when you are down, somebody uplifts you, and when somebody else is down, you can uplift them. So let's talk about the community message board and stigma. Next slide, please. We had the opportunity uh, with this big team, and one of the reasons I put this slide in is you can see all of these different authors. This was a huge group of people that I'm uh, privileged to work with and also privileged to represent. Um, and uh, I wanted to tell you about the people who made this possible, who were our participants in the initial study. As you can see there, there were 77, and you don't have to go through all those numbers. I'll tell you they were uh, majority male, uh, majority non-white. 72% uh, of them lived below 100% of the federal poverty level, so they were lower, low income, uh, lower income individuals. Um, and there was a mix that is pretty typical of different kinds of risk factors for acquiring HIV. Um, next slide, please. So what we did was we looked at the community message board over 30 months of people using the community message board. There were over 22,000 20, posts and about a fifth of them were related to stigma. And members of our team went through and read each one and sorted them into groups. Um, and one part of the grouping was to sort them into uh, positive comments that were um, telling about positive individual experiences or group experiences, and then negative um, comments, all related to stigma. Um, and then we also separated them into intrapersonal and interpersonal. So meaning stigma that people felt um, inside themselves versus stigma that they experienced um, in their families or in the communities. You can see that it's about half positive in the top two boxes um, and half uh, negative. Um, and unfortunately, the biggest group, not by much, is the 33% on the bottom there that is interpersonal negative. So we do know that at least in this group of people, a lot of the stigma that was experienced uh, was uh, related to uh, interactions with other people, at least the stigma that people talked about on the community message board. Next slide, please. So, in terms of thinking a little bit about what were the kinds of themes, let's start at the top here, and that's the negative. Um, fortunately, there was less negative than positive. Um, if any of you are um, adding up uh, percentages, it may not add up to, it will not add up to 100% because some things could be listed in more than one category. Uh, but if we look at the experiences of stigma that were found, um, in terms of intrapersonal, uh, there was, a fair bit of negative framing of the HIV positive status, of feeling badly as understandably about having HIV. Um, and then in terms of interpersonal, the thing I really want to focus on in terms of uh, challenges with stigma that were described on the board were a lot of challenges and concerns about disclosure of status. Moving down uh, the table, you see the positive uh, strategies for overcoming stigma. And I am happy to report that there were more uh, positive um, strategies that had to do with uh, finding ways to live with uh, HIV positive status, affirming self-worth, um, and also finding uh, true uh, quote-unquote relationships. Um, so all of these types of comments were made on the board. And let me show you a couple of those. Next slide, please. So in terms of intrapersonal stigma, an example of that is here uh, on the left. And we took these quotes uh, from the board and most people use, um, uh, use it sort of like texting. So we left people's um, uh, very own words. Um, on the left, you see, I just found out I'm HIV positive five days ago, and the woman I got it from treat me like, and I'm in Virginia with no family, and she'd tell me I'll never get nobody else because I have HIV. This is the first time I felt bad. So there's a person that's sharing this horrible experience. 
I can tell you that there were then eight people that came in and provided support. Um, another uh, type um, of uh, comment is on the right, and this is a positive one. I strive to look at things in my life for the better and show my three children that anything is possible if you have faith. HIV positive hasn't changed me at all. So also positive comments. All, again, on this community message board, only for people living with HIV. I want to specify that people from the clinic, people from our organization are not on this board. It is only people living with HIV having a space where they can share. Next slide, please. This is what I was talking about with interpersonal stigma. And as you will see in, um, on the left-hand side in the gray quote, this is the negative one. This has to do with disclosure. Um, this is someone who uh, disclosed to someone else and then that person told other people and that was uh, a horrible experience. Again, I can tell you that this person got a lot of support after sharing this story. On the right, um, you see uh, that um, this person is describing how what she calls the positive link family um, has given her the opportunity to have more support and to um, uh, address uh, interpersonal stigma. Next slide, please. So these are the various kinds of threads. And the main thing that I want uh, to share about this is I was alluding to this before that uh, those quotes that I was showing, those give you a sense of the kinds of painful issues that people actually have the space to share, but also the kinds of support that people are able to bring. And I'll note that a lot of that kind of conversation is happening, you know, in the middle of the night, when and where uh, people are able to have it. Maybe it's after uh, other people in the family went to bed. Maybe it's the only time people have a private space to be able to be in that conversation. Maybe it's just when you're sitting up alone worrying um, and you just want to put that out there. And a lot of times there's somebody else there uh, who knows something about what you're going through and can respond. So I'm not going to go through each one of these different kinds of conversations, uh, but you'll see uh, if you just take a peek at the numbers that most of them are positive and they really focus on great strategies for overcoming stigma, uh, particularly looking for strength and companionship uh, in faith um, and in developing self-efficacy. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what we were able to document. So uh, the most important thing is the way people are feeling and experiencing stigma. And it's hard to bring that out um, uh, uh, in a number. Um, it's impossible to bring that out in a number. But this is one way uh, that we tried um, to get a sense of whether uh, there was a difference um, between the beginning uh, of the project and at 12 months. Um, to let you know something um, uh, about uh, people who were posting on the community message board, we actually looked uh, to see who was most likely to post on the community message board because in other online support groups, um, the demographics, the kind of people who have been involved have mostly been white women. Um, and I'm a white woman, I've got nothing against white women, but uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't only serving uh, white women. And when we looked at who um, uh, was posting on the board, the most likely people to post on the board were non-white, not virally suppressed, and lower income. Um, and so we were really pleased um, that this space, thanks to the design input of the people who made this, who is our patients, was experienced as a safe space um, for uh, people that historically had struggled um, with living and thriving with HIV. So I wanted to say that uh, right out front. So in terms of uh, whether or not people improved their stigma scores, 
um, you can see that those who didn't post on the community message board in the top row had a, just a slight uh, decrease in their stigma. Um, if you posted on the community message board and you didn't include any stigma um, talk in your posts, you decreased a little bit more. And the people who decreased the most were ones that actually talked about stigma on the message board. And we thought that that uh, was a really interesting finding. Um, and similar uh, to findings where people have uh, Im had improved, um, uh, uh, I should say, a decreased sense of stigma through having in-person support. So we were really glad to see that. I'd like to say that the baseline stigma scores were not associated with age or race, gender, education, nothing. Um, every, everybody was equally likely to have uh, a high or low stigma score. Um, and the other thing that I want to uh, note is that baseline stigma scores were associated with um, stress, baseline stress, and also with low self-efficacy. Uh, so I wanted to mention that because I think that we have to acknowledge uh, the, the consequences of stigma that is experienced by individuals and again that is inflicted by people in communities. That stress, we know more and more about the ways in which stress is, uh, has negative impacts on people's health and well-being far beyond what we ever expected. So we must address stigma. In addition, that self-efficacy to start and stay in care, uh, uh, that is something that we wanna promote. And one way to promote it is to get stigma, to get that discrimination out of our communities. Um, the other thing that I'd like to note is that the decrease in stigma scores in this study was associated with male gender. So we may need to do more and different things uh, for women living with HIV. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm uh, finishing up here. Um, I'd just like to say in closing um, that this clinic deployed mobile platform with an anonymous online support group that is private and only available to people who are associated with a particular organization who get their care uh, through that organization was associated with a decrease in measured stigma. And that is probably um, due to many reasons, uh, but may be uh, particularly related to participation in uh, the online support group. It is also possible that other features of positive links, like the ability to more easily connect with providers, um, to get more information, and to develop coping skills also contributed. So we need a larger study. Um, and uh, because reading all those posts is kind of long, we're hoping to do some natural language processing, um, just to sound geeky for a second. Um, and uh, we'll be doing a, also a randomized controlled trial uh, to be able to try to better assess um, uh, whether uh, the use of the platform is actually associated with decreased stigma. Um, but I also want to say in this particular moment of COVID, um, we have about 650 of our eight, almost 900 patients um, in our clinic uh, who are on this platform now. So that's a huge proportion of our clinic. And wow, the Positive Links platform has been buzzing um, through this time of COVID when people have to remain socially distanced um, and aren't able to connect in the ways that they would usually with family, with friends, with others. And so um, I think that exploring the opportunities for mHealth um, in addition to telehealth to allow consumers uh, not only to connect with providers, but also to connect safely with each other and to develop better skills uh, to maintain and improve their health uh, in these very challenging times is something that uh, we can all uh, think about. Next slide, please. And so with that, I'll leave you with this quote from one of our participants uh, that speaks to the empowerment that this person felt uh, related to becoming involved in the Positive Links family, and I will look forward to your questions. Next slide. Next slide. 
Outstanding. Dr. Dillingham, thank you so much for sharing the M Health pl platform and its notable impact on stigma. Thank you so much. And, and uh, we'll take questions and answers at the end of this session. Next up, we're looking forward to a rich presentation on the work of NASDAQ and its uh, work on stigma in rural communities. Uh, Jennifer Flanagan will be presenting today. Uh, thank you for participating, Jennifer. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us for today's session. My name is Jennifer Flanagan and I'm a manager on the health systems integration team at NASDAQ. My work focuses on supporting NASDAQ's technical assistance and capacity building for Health Department's Ryan White HIV AIDS program, with a focus on ending the HIV epidemic initiative activities, as well as strengthening systems of care for people with HIV and OUD. And I am joined by my colleague, Laura Pegram, and I will turn it over to her so she can introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having us. So um, like Jennifer said, my name is Laura. Um, I'm the Associate Director for Drug User Health over here at NASDAQ. Um, that's a relatively new um, uh, department or agency team that we have uh, here on, on board. And uh, I work primarily with health departments, um, their HIV and viral hepatitis programs, and increasingly drug user health staff, um, as well as community-based groups over the last many years uh, to provide a variety of different types of technical assistance. And stigma is, is, a, is a best in terms of requests. Um, so really glad to talk a little bit and add in about some of the, the ways we approach that work related to drug use, people who struggle with mental health challenges, people who are at risk for HIV and infectious disease related to, uh, to the substance use. So glad to be here. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Laura. Next slide, please. We do not have any financial or non-financial interest to disclose and commercial support was not received for this activity. Uh, next slide, please. You will see here um, our learning objectives and outcomes. At the conclusion of this activity, participants will be able to discuss how HIV-related stigma impacts us, the communities that we're a part of, and the people that we serve, locate resources and support that's relative to reducing implicit bias and HIV stigma, as well as improving health equity, and recommend technical assistance opportunities to reach priority populations and identify how they can be to applied to one's work. Next slide, please. So before we dive into our work and our resources and some of the highlights from jurisdictions, uh, we wanna make sure that everyone gets to know us as an organization. So you will see our lovely staff here. Uh, NASDAQ is a leading nonpartisan nonprofit association that represents public health officials who administer HIV and hepatitis programs in the US. And our singular mission is to end the intersecting epidemics of HIV, viral hepatitis, and related conditions. And we do this work by strengthening domestic and global governmental public health through advocacy, capacity building, and social justice. And our vision is a world free of HIV and viral hepatitis. Next slide, please. We are pleased to share NASDAQ's commitment to Black Lives. At NASDAQ, we recognize the interconnected nature of racism, access to care, stigma, and the need to increase attention on supporting systems and services that value black and brown lives. We encourage participants to visit NASDAQ's entire statement on our website using the link in the resource section of this presentation. Next slide, please. So this slide is a refresher and Dr. Dillingham did a great job of um, highlighting some of the issues around st uh, stigma and rural health. Uh, but it is important to highlight uh, the barriers that are encountered in rural areas. Um, but for the sake of time and the fact that we've covered this a little bit, uh, I will go ahead and leave this up here just for you to see and we will continue our discussion. So next slide, please. We're excited to share an overview of NASDAQ's resources and concepts. The first that we'll focus on is the bar before the bars. And stigma remains a major and persistent fundamental social cause associated with health inequity over time, regardless of the factors of health interventions. Stigma and other social determinants influence the HIV care continuum before a diagnosis is even made. This concept drives much of our work at NASDAQ and is frequently incorporated in conversations that we have with jurisdictions, 
And as you'll see on the slide, we do have a few that are noted. Racism, poverty, homophobia, and the biggest one in the middle, stigma, um, homelessness, et cetera. Next, we will look at the blueprint for improving HIV STD prevention and care outcomes for Black and Latino gay men. And this is down in the left corner here. This document was updated in 2018, but was originally released in 2014. And this was a joint effort by NASDAD and our colleagues at National Coalition of STD Directors, or NCSD. This was released after conducting a three-year study of stigma and its impact on public health practice for gay and Latino, um, Black and Latino gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men, or GBM. I will share a little bit more about this resource in upcoming slides. I also want to point to the Talking Points, the resource guide for facilitating stigma conversations. To accelerate the end of, HIV ep of the HIV epidemic, NASDAQ recognized that conversations about HIV stigma must be at the forefront of our work. This microsite includes videos, tools and tips on how to implement your own stigma conversations, and it allows health departments and other partners to have a dialogue and a document that includes information around data collection, what's available, what data to collect, how do you identify stakeholders, who do we need to bring at the table, clear guidance to plan and host stigma conversations, and how to develop action plans for future programming around stigma reduction. It also includes a pre-stigma conversation tool that can be administered, and you'll hear a little bit more about this throughout the presentation. The guide also includes examples of facilitation guides that can be adapted to develop one's own stigma conversation. And several videos are included on the microsite, including one that we will share with you today. I wanna to highlight another resource that the image is not on the slide. However, there is a link in the resource documents and it's called His Health. His Health is a product of collaboration among black GBM, healthcare and service providers, public health professionals, federal health agencies, LGBT advocates, and community stakeholders. As of October 4th, 2019, continuing education credits will no longer be offered for the six courses. However, the material, which is a dynamic training tool that includes innovative models of care and evidence-based resources to support the delivery of high quality and culturally affirming healthcare services for Black GBM, it is available online, and again, the link is in the resource slide. Now, I do want to highlight Georgia, one of our partners. Um, in 2017, Georgia's state AIDS director was so inspired by this tool that he decided to use his health to train all HIV prevention providers that were funded by the Office of HIV AIDS in Georgia to address the health inequity that Black GBM confront along the HIV care continuum in the state, they successfully developed a mandate that required all staff to enroll in his health trainings. The mandate demonstrates OHA's commitment to make holistic, affirming, and culturally responsive care for the standard, to serve as a standard, excuse me, for young Black GBM patients. His health topics have been on the agenda for their summits, um, around GBM health, all state provider meetings, as well as multiple regional and provider specific trainings. The HIV related stigma that persists in Georgia, coupled with OHA's urgency to provide specialized training to their staff in all areas of Georgia, regardless of the population, regarding this population, served as an impetus to implement this mandate. So we are happy to share this information about Georgia and again, this tool is available online, even though the credits are not applicable anymore. And Laura and I will be sharing innovative approaches throughout the presentation. And Laura will also be sharing her experiences as well. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows some of NASDAQ's previous work. Um, again, everything's available on our website. What I wanna highlight is that the national survey uh, that was conducted previously reached more than 1,300 respondents. It included a convening of the, black, of the blue ribbon panel of stakeholders and medical providers. And as an outcome, there was a development of optimal care checklists for providers and for black and Latino GBM patients. Also, there is a convening of a national summit on stigma surrounding black and Latino GBM men's health. 
The blueprint looks at how stigma and other social determinants impact the HIV care continuum, specifically for Black and Latino GBM, and exploring the bar before the bars that we spoke about earlier. The Addressing Stigma Blueprint also put forth 17 recommendations. Again, I highly encourage folks to check this out. Next slide, please. So where are we going? So NASDAQ recently relaunched stigma work with a focus to empower jurisdictions to prioritize HIV stigma in their work and to highlight best practices that can be replicated across the United States, specifically for people who use drugs and focus on the overlap of stigma and other social determinants, including social structures and discrimination. And you'll see the relaunch, program, the relaunch components here, uh, which are the videos, the how-to guide that I described, several summits that we have had, and we'll describe those in, in more detail, and tailored technical assistance. Next slide, please. So now we would like to share with you a video that is used in the delivery of HIV stigma related technical assistance. This video, along with all other videos and resources on the NASDAQ microsite, may be used by jurisdictions. NASDAQ staff uses this video as part of our stigma trainings with various organizations and settings. This video can also be used as an introduction for building awareness among provider and front office staff and could also be played in the waiting room of medical offices that have televisions that promote public health messages. And I will pause now to play the video. We need to have more conversations around stigma and implicit bias, especially at a stage where we've accelerated our efforts to end the HIV epidemic so much, yet we still find ourselves so far away from eliminating and eradicating HIV. Since the start of HIV in the early 1980s, the communities that have been most affected by HIV have the ones that have been most ostracized. So for example, gay men, gay bisexual, other men who have sex with men, we're talking about sex workers, persons who inject drugs, and then continuing on to today, we're still seeing communities don't want to discuss or talk about or really engage in the ways that we prevent the spread of HIV for these communities because of the stigmatizing nature of HIV. Three levels of stigma that we see are at the institutional level, the community level, and the interpersonal level, or the personal level itself too. So at the institutional level, you see stigma really show itself in laws, policies, procedures that reduce and prevent certain um, resources being going best to different communities in need. Community level stigma can be defined as prejudices, stereotypes, or beliefs that an entire group of people hold towards an individual or a group of individuals that might have a specific characteristic. It can be their HIV status, but it can also be their race, their ethnicity, the language they speak, or the country they're from. When you talk about individual um, stigma, you're talking about the internal person. And they start to believe the things that they're actually hearing about themselves. Stigma and implicit bias manifest itself in a variety of ways to hinder people's access to care. Some examples of that could be um, shame that people might experience, either within themselves or from other individuals to actually have conversations around their sexual health practices with their primary care providers. It could be fear that they have of being judged so they won't go out and, and get tested and avoid a diagnosis. Or it could be fear of disclosure of their HIV status once they have a diagnosis to their partners, to their families, and to their friends because they don't want to feel ostracized from their in-network or their in-group. The way stigma manifests itself, you can see it just in looking at the level of inequity that exists within our society. You have people of color um, who are experiencing you know, significant uh, health inequities, and that is a direct result of the stigma and the ongoing burden that's being placed on them uh, each and every day. Stigma, you know, is literally killing people because it forces people into a, a level of isolation that's just not sustainable. One of the big problems we have with stigma is that it's constantly being reinforced by implicit bias. And what implicit bias really is are these internalized prejudices, attitudes, or beliefs that we have towards a certain group of people or towards an individual that we don't really know that we have. So a lot of people don't consider themselves racist, um, but they might act differently towards a group of people or a person without even realizing it. Implicit bias and stigma prevents individuals from getting adequate care because it, it discourages them from wanting to seek that. The way in which you know, they are treated you know, going into a clinic visit will, will really uh, make or break whether or not they're going to return. 
Um, and what's so uh, unfortunate about that is that, you know, it keeps people unhealthy. It keeps people sick, you know, uh, and in the end, you know, sometimes it kills people, you know, because we're not willing, you know, to check our environments and make sure that those environments are fostering a welcoming and affirming environment, you know, to folks. We need to fund stigma reduction programs because of how valuable they are in the response to HIV. We know that stigma is one of the leading reasons why people do not get HIV tested. They do not seek treatment if they are, if they are themselves positive. Knowing this, we need to make sure that those barriers that are in place because of stigma and discrimination are removed. Health departments and community-based organizations can take a variety of steps to help have conversations around stigma and address implicit bias. A few examples of these might be cultural, cultural responsiveness trainings uh, within the health department for staff or leadership. It can be um, creating affirming spaces through signage and appropriate language. But it can also be um, providing services outside of normal working hours, weekend clinics, mobile clinics, or after hours clinics. It is the mission of public health uh, to serve a public good. Uh, and in order for us to fulfill that mission, uh, it is our uh, responsibility um, you know, to address stigma and implicit bias. There's no way of ending the HIV epidemic without addressing stigma. By making sure that uh, places, making sure health facilities are welcoming and engaging of communities is the only way you're going to fully be able to find everyone living with HIV in the United States, as well as be actually able to get them on treatment and continuous treatment and care for the rest of their lives. Before going into additional resources, I'd like to share a few examples from states that have implemented innovative approaches to addressing stigma within their state and also within rural areas of their state. Uh, one particular state hosted a stigma summit, and this was connected with a technical, technical assistance visit that we conducted. In 2018, staff at a health department in a rural area expressed an interest in technical assistance concerning the lack of engagement of black GBM in the Ryan White HIV AIDS program. For perspective, 37.3% of all of the state's GBM are living with HIV, compared to 6.8% of white GBM. As part of the technical assistance request, the state wanted to ensure that the, the provider community and the consumer community, as part of the technical assistance request, the state wanted to ensure that the provider community and the consumer community were involved in planning efforts. This presented an opportunity to convene an in-person two-day summit with all stakeholders present, as well as conduct a focus group discussion without the health department staff present. The summit goals were to identify health equity challenges in HIV prevention, care, and treatment for Black GBM, assess current gaps in culturally responsive care for people living with or at risk for HIV, particularly for communities of color in the state and to develop action plans for integrating cultural responsive care in their programming and scope of work. A pre-meeting survey was conducted to gather an understanding of capacity around the key topics, including culturally responsive care and trauma-informed approaches. They also explored perceptions of the health department as well as statewide efforts to engage Black GBM. During the focus group, NASDAQ staff and participants discussed the needs of Black GBM and the overall HIV response efforts. One focus group finding was that the providers did need anti-stigma training. At the end of the summit, there were clear actionable items starting over the, six, the next six months uh, that was developed and created by stakeholders. The action plan included the implementation, the implementation of activities, including the NASDAQ stigma toolkit and his health. The summit served as a safe space to discuss barriers to access care and solutions. As a result, a gay men's health committee was created to explore programming and still in place. Provide one other um, example before turning it over to my colleague. Uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, which is a combination of, of rural and suburban, uh, two all day suburb, in Tallahassee, Florida, <laughs> earlier this year, two all day trainings were held in Florida. Each training had about 25 participants and the training was held around cultural responsiveness and implicit bias within the central office. 
The staff plans to take this training on the road throughout the rest of the state to replicate in other counties, as well as to potentially include cultural responsiveness training directly into their HR orientation for new hires. The goal of the training was to review foundational concepts around health equity, stigma, implicit bias, and intersectionality to explore Florida's HIV epidemiological profile through an intersectional lens to facilitate conversations about the ways in which HIV related stigma shows up both within and outside of the health department and how this may cause barriers to care. Uh, they also have the opportunity to brainstorm culturally responsive strategies that they can incorporate into their work and as individuals to advance health equity to shift the culture of the health department. And one more note, um, I was very pleased to see Dr. Dillingham on today's panel. NASAD created an implementation under the HRSA SPINS project in partnership with the University of Virginia's Ryan White HIV AIDS program to assist people with replicating the positive links intervention. So it was a pleasure uh, to virtually see her today. Next slide. Um, so these next slides are just a few resources. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is we have several technical assistance centers. Please feel free um, to visit us. We have HEPTAC, which is the Hepatitis Technical Assistance Center. We store success stories um, as well as Resource Bank. Uh, we are a um, SCIP provider for systems coordination, SEBA provider for capacity building, et cetera. Um, but I do want to point out at the top right, the COVID-19 statement. This was released in May and encourages I, again, we encourage folks to visit our website. In light of the COVID-19 pandemic's impact on communities of color in the US, particularly on Black, Native American, and Latinx communities, NASDAQ released a statement and a call to action. NASDAQ recognizes the need to prioritize the voices of emerging leaders of color in public health and in such, prioritize the expertise of our minority leadership program network to develop these recommendations. So please, 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 visit this when you get an opportunity. And next slide, please. Um, here's some more examples of TA, uh, but I do not want to take any more time from Laura. Next slide, please. And uh, I would love to turn it over to Laura Pegram. She's conducted numerous technical assistance activities all over the US, including several rural convenings. I'm excited for her to share her and her team's unique perspective of having stigma conversations in rural areas as it relates to drug user health. So, Laura? Awesome, thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, I really gave Jennifer the hard part of this presentation. <laughs> I was just like, I'll just come on and talk. It's gonna be great. Um, but I'll, you know, I'll try to keep this brief. You know, when, when Jennifer reached out um, to me and several others at NASDAQ who have kind of helped uh, contribute to, to the presentation overall and some of the, some of the variety of ways that, um, that we really approach technical assistance, um, especially you know, hearing even just this title, right? Rural and innovative approaches um, to addressing stigma. We really, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm sure I have lots to say about that because I feel like I work primarily in rural communities um, and innovative was the, was the word that stuck to me because, you know, all so often a lot of the way that um, my team, uh, the drug user health team here at NASDAQ, who primarily, you know, works with health departments and community-based groups, you know, the ways we work with these, with communities, especially rural communities, um, I don't know if I, you know, want to call it innovative. It, it's as common sense as could be, but it seems to be a new message, right? A message that, um, you know, if, if, if what you and your community need are someone to come talk through um, implicit bias and bias around drug use and bias around harm reduction programs, um, talk through what it means to meaningfully um, coordinate efforts uh, and, and provide a universal um, understanding and language about what stigma is and how it shows up in terms of health disparities for people who use drugs. I mean, at the, at the, at the end of the day, if you want me to come talk about how to improve work with people who use drugs by uh, reminding folks that there are people first and foremost, and people that, that we and all of our agencies need to work with um, and need to improve our work with, uh, then yeah, I guess it's innovative. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the, you know, like I said at the beginning, the most commonly thing I get, common thing I get requested to come and provide different sorts of trainings and presentations um, on is really, um, you know, stigma 
improving work with people who use drugs, uh, meaningful engagement of people who use drugs. And at the core of the day, the like end of the day, I mean, that's really just about humanizing a very human thing. And so, um, you know, I appreciate the time to kind of talk through this because I, I do think that stigma related to HIV is certainly one layer here. Um, and and uh, intersectionality has been brought up in several different presentations. Um, but, you know, stigma around drug use and HIV and those intersections with overdose and health disparities, I mean, there's just a lot of levels here, right? So when we're talking about stigma, we're talking about stigma that's related to the people who use drugs themselves and often working with programs and agencies and, and, and health services to remind folks that these are people in your community first. And, and um, you know, I, I'm always surprised and grateful that I get this job to go do this innovative thing, which is really just have hard conversations um, and have conversations that challenge us to check ourselves and what we bring to the work and how we, how, you know, bias and, and stigma play, uh, play into um, both our services, ourselves and, and uh, the, you know, the, um, our communities, right? Because we all have these different levels of needing to approach you know, stigma and address stigma in meaningful ways. Um, so there's there's definitely the stigma related to people who use drugs, um, and uh, there's definitely stigma related to infectious disease. Um, and the idea of uh, Leslie said it, you know, clean, dirty. Um, we have all these built up notions and ideas about what drug use looks like. Um, and and the reality is is that statistics just don't, you know, the numbers just don't bear that out, right? The majority of people who use drugs, inject drugs, use opioids or meth, you never really know vast majority and and so we need to start breaking down some of the things that we were taught from a very young age right and that's that's a, a unique challenge um, and then we also have stigma related to harm reduction and syringe access programs in communities and there's sort of a different level of needing to be good at communicating and learn how to communicate around those programs and to order in order to make them be accepted and supported um, and really uh, you know in, in ingrained um, in, in how uh, you know it really be central to how uh, we are creating services to meaningful to meaningfully um, engage people who use drugs so a lot of different levels here um, and yeah, like Jennifer said, um, so I mean, I'll, I'll just say for, for many years, I was the, the only person here at NASDAQ who does, um, you know, who is, who is doing our harm reduction and drug user health work. And so, you know, in the span of three years or so, I visited well over 40 states, many of them multiple times, often repeat requests to come back and talk to different stakeholder groups about stigma. Um, and so there is something uh, that is, uh, that is, so vitally needed and desired about having these conversations that I think it falls in the category of innovative, <laughs> um, you know, uh, creating space for that. And, you know, anyone, any of you who work in bureaucracies and health departments know that there's not often a whole ton of space for that. So making space intentionally is really innovative in its own way. Um, but never being someone who wants to waste time. I mean, I did think of some extra level of innovation, um, you know, thinking about uh, really trying to make sure that it's not just health departments and, and Ryan White programs and program staff who are getting this message, right? Because if we broaden this out to the community level and the range of services people who use drugs need um, or might need, Need, then we're really talking about a lot of multi-sectoral responses and a lot of coordination. So if I'm going to go to a rural place um, and, you know, talk about reducing stigma to all the HIV staff or all the hepatitis staff, infectious disease, then like, ooh, I'm going to find a way to get into your behavioral health agency. <laughs> I'm gonna find a way to get at your opioid conference, at your overdose prevention conferences, because these things are happening all the time and people are, um, the thing I'll note is that, you know, we all have different languages for how we, how we approach and talk about drug use. Right, and how we, you know, what we focus on, right? NASDAQ focuses primarily on infectious disease. There's a whole different agency about injury prevention and overdose. There's a whole different agency about behavioral health. And what we really need is sort of a universal framework to really ground ourselves in, in, in how we're addressing stigma and improving our work with people who use drugs, right? We need, to, we need to level the playing field so that we all know that we're using similar language that we're all kind of approaching this from a perspective that is coordinated because drug use and infectious disease related to drug use is really this nexus of um, the need for, for you know, this, this is this endemic, right? This is, you know, we need coordinated responses um, and it's, it's, you know, so we need to all be operating from sort of the same 
the same place. So, you know, I will always um, be available and open to, you know, if I'm coming to West Virginia to say to do a training, to, to spend a couple extra days and go, go talk to community leaders around uh, sort of what I think of as a drug user health framework, that building this, this base of understanding about what drug use is and, and why we are taught at a young age to view people who use drugs as less than inferior, dirty, unclean, um, and, and really just break down some internal biases and then talk about biases within our agencies and services, right? So, um, you know, really thinking outside of the box in terms of our uh, primary stakeholder groups. Like I said, primarily we work with infectious disease, um, but, you know, in a state like West Virginia, you know, community, uh, county level, local level health officers are a really important community stakeholder who have a lot of sway, especially in small rural places. So, like, absolutely. You want me to come talk to them too? I absolutely will. You want me to help with the agenda? Sure thing. <laughs> let's, let's, let's spread this message far and wide because we know that there's not going to be a coordinated response unless everyone's on board, right? Um, so, so that's one, you know, great example and sort of ongoing communication with, the, you know, with them and many other Appalachian uh, states around building support for programs. Um, you know, some other examples I'm trying to think. So Utah, a couple of years ago, we pushed ourselves onto, um, you know, we were out there to do a one-day training uh, for program staff uh, who are actually running syringe access programs, and I was like, ooh, maybe we should choose a date that's right by, you know, a statewide opioid conference. Let's push ourselves onto that agenda. Push. Let's let's invite ourselves. Let's get asked to that agenda as, you know, so that, so that behavioral health folks and injury prevention folks and, and service providers in the broader community can all kind of have a chance to all get to know each other. Um, and again, it doesn't feel innovative like we all talk to each other because we do related work, but any of you who work in health departments know that that's harder than you think. Any of you who work at the federal level, that's harder than you think, right? CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, you know, how often do we really coordinate? You know, and so, and really have these conversations together about what a unified approach looks like. Um, similar in, in North Dakota, you know, I spent some time, uh, you know, talking, you know, speaking a few times at a behavioral health summit um, that is statewide and included all the social workers and a lot of the case managers for corrections. You know, it's about finding these opportunities where there's gonna be a diverse stakeholder group and then just, making the case to parachute in there. I, I don't know how else to say it. Um, you know, and, and I just think <laughs> that, you know, sure, innovative, whatever, fine. But, you know, this, this is not, uh, the, the conversation and making the space for it is really the thing that we need the commitment for. Once you have that and sort of buy into that, there are all these different ways that we can be creative around making sure that we're getting the messages to the right place and the right people. Um, and I will say, like, I love the North Dakota. Like, I've been to North Dakota four or five times. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, in, increasingly, you know, they invited me back to come and talk to all the county level social workers, um, which is an important role in a lot of really rural small communities that are seeing a lot of drug use and a lot of overdose and a lot of poverty and mental health challenges and really just, you know, having space to, to kind of talk through those things, um, you know, and then, uh, you know, there were, are, have, you know, out of these sorts of requests have really streamlined different conversations for different stakeholder groups um, that work in even more remote, smaller communities. And, uh, you know, that's really valuable in my world, right? In a thinking about, you know, a, a Midwestern and I'm from the Midwest, you know, uh, Midwestern or Southern small town to have a health officer who, uh, you know, has been given the chance to kind of explore his or their own implicit bias. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, some of these rural health officers can, can, you know, they're not all young people. And so seeing, you know, seeing some of these transformational moments with a real range of folks from different backgrounds, um, different age groups, different, different identities and, and diversities, um, you know, has been a real honor for me. And I, I love the challenge of, of, you know, trying to figure out how we can expand our reach. Because these conversations, like Jennifer said, with a lot of our other uh, stigma resources is about how how, how do we as service, you know, how does we as, how do we as TA folks really work with agencies to um, have these conversations? Because it's not just like a thing you know how to do. You figure out how to do it and then, you know, you figure out how to message and message for different folks too. And so, um, you know, I, I am always really, uh, sometimes I think it's like one of the sad things, right? That the most common request I get is, is to come talk about stigma and how to treat people who use drugs like people. Um, and it's also, 
just such an opportunity moment that I will never turn one down. I love going to do it. And it's, it's just this, this moment of just like, I'm so glad that you're here for this conversation today. Like, let's make it a thing. And like, let's make it as big of a thing as we can with as broad of a reach as we can. Um, and I think that they're vitally important conversations to be having both in rural and everywhere in America right now. Um, and I'm always really grateful uh, that, that NASDAQ and other organizations are here to be able to help field some of those requests and come help navigate what are tricky conversations sometimes. So I'm gonna stop because I know I'm at seven minutes, but uh, yeah, innovative and rural and um, you know, always grateful for the opportunity there. Thank you so much, Laura. And um, obviously we enjoy what we do. We have a blast getting to meet everyone and, I do want to, you know, kind of just reiterate what Laura said around what the feedback that we get from the jurisdictions, which is what gives me so much motivation is we've never done this before. We've never been able to talk about this before. We tried to have this conversation 10 years ago and people wouldn't hear it. And now they are. So mm -hmm. we are here um, as stated throughout the presentation, you know, I know there's a lot of links. Please visit all of them. Please visit our website. Um, our contact information, um, if you go to the next slide, please, is, is right here. So uh, we like to say at NASDAQ, there is no wrong door. So if for some reason you know someone else that you reach out to, do that as well. We've got seven different programs, um, but it's been a pleasure to be here today and we are looking forward to your questions. Absolutely. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Jennifer and Laura. This was indeed a rich presentation. It addressed targeted populations, evidence-based programs, getting the message out, resources, and so much more. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. So um, we've had three um, outstanding presentations. Um, it's for you to digest and uh, consider what kinds of questions and answers we have you have for them um, today. So we're going to pass it over to Sonia Hunt Gray, and she's going to lead the uh, question and answer session. Thank you all. All right, thank you. We'll start with the first question. <laughs> 